this is going to have to be... Oh. Okay, no, we're good. For, <laughs> for a second I thought it was 4.47. No, okay, 3.37. Perfect. What kind of gets me is some of my gyms on the weekends, they close at 6. Not ideal. Uh, I mean, it's not like you don't have all day to go to the gym on the weekend, but... You know, sometimes five o'clock just rolls by and you're like, holy shit. I gotta go. No. So, oh yeah. Two hours-ish once I get there. More than enough time to destroy arms. Plus, I'm doing a little bit lower volume now, so... The workouts themselves just take a little bit less time. Plan for triceps is I'm definitely gonna get some overhead pressing going on. Like... Everybody knows the movement where you sit down on a bench, you throw a dumbbell over your head, and you're going back like that. But I don't really love that one. Maybe, maybe the reason I think my long head is slacking is because I don't love those. But it's just kind of a weird movement. Something about it with my shoulder. Oh, whatever. But I definitely think that my triceps have some size to be gained. Some muscle to be stimulated. <laughs> Uh, by getting some overhead stuff going. Because I've got the pushdowns locked in. You know, tons of weight, huge pump every time, but you know, I just think i got to attack tries from a different angle. So I'll kind of jerry-rig a little cable setup so I can do some. Really what I need is like just a normal bench seat for a shoulder press. You know where it's just like a, literally like a chair, a padded chair for shoulder press. Because you can butt that up right against a cable stack. And it's such an easy setup. So since they only have normal benches, where once you put them on an incline, the stand kind of like extends this far back, you can't really set it up like that. It takes a little bit more ingenuity. You know, but if you come up with some kind of machine uh, combination or something or whatever, and you think it'll work, then try it, you know? I've gotten some pretty solid calf pumps by sitting on a seated, or uh, sitting on a lying leg curl backwards, putting the pad on top of my knees, and then doing calf raises. You know, you can use shit in multiple ways and get something out of it. Now, that's not going to imply that you won't look stupid, perhaps. But if it works, it works. So, eight sets of tries of a solid variety. I can foresee pushdowns, dips, overhead extensions, Maybe dumbbell kickbacks. Haven't done those for a while. Tries me pumped. After that, curls is. I think I've got the bicep training down pretty good. You know, I hit a variety of curls, completely pump them up, and they're pretty strong as well. So, I'll. I don't know. Typically, I start with heavy dumbbell curls because that's probably the movement where, well, I'm the strongest I can go the heaviest, put the most tension on my biceps. You know, really just get some working reps done. But last arm day, I started off with lighter machine preacher curls. And instead of doing a first set where I'm like just going to absolute failure with as much weight as I can do within like a 10-ish rep range, you know, I just started off with more of a burnout set. Really getting a good squeeze, holding it for just a moment, coming back down slow, stuff like that. I see people do all sorts of different styles of training and they emphasize so many different aspects of it. You know, everybody knows about all sorts of, I guess, there's just so many I can't even get into it. It's like, I hear FST7 talked about interval meso sets where, come on, as long as you go hard, you get a pump and you notice a trend of growth over a certain period of time. And guess what? You're doing something. Now, it's, I'm not trying to tell you not to try to optimize it as your training progresses. Even I'm, tr I'm trying to do that, man. I'm trying to get my training better. Yeah, I want to do this as efficiently and effectively as possible. But I make this analogy all the time. The high school football kid who goes into the gym and just tries to go fucking bananas on biceps probably going to build a bigger set of arms than the kind of dorky kid doing low intensity, even though that kid may be doing his reps perfectly, with perfect form, perfect execution. 
you know, intensity is going to outweigh effectiveness. But, well, you know what I'm trying to say there. So, <laughs> make sure you have the intensity down, and then improve the effectiveness over time. Or vice versa. It's, uh, each of those things are going to play in off of each other. But for the most part, you're never going to go wrong going hard on a set. I can say that with 100% belief. So I'm gonna warm up my elbows, my shoulders a little bit. And we just jump into the first working set. No calf check pump. Calf check pump. Calf pump check. And whatever. They honestly don't even get that crazy when they're pumped. In that sense, I think calves are similar to hamstrings and triceps. And maybe even quads a little bit. You know, when they're pumped, Obviously, they're going to be momentarily bigger, same with any muscle, but they're just going to lose some definition, you know. So in that sense, I never, I never really check my calf pumps too often. Uh, maybe if I'm wearing shorts, I'll, I will a little bit. You know, how, often am I, how often am I really wearing shorts? How often am I wearing shorts? Rarely. Very freaking rarely. So, what did today's diet consist of? I had, uh, oh my, you gotta, okay, I'll, let me put you on to something. You gotta go to Costco and get individually sealed, like, these five pound turkey breasts. Pre cooked. Oh my god, it's just the perfect poultry style of protein, in my opinion. You know, I'd rather have a block of that sitting in the fridge where I can cut off, like, an eight ounce, I mean, I almost wanna say an eight ounce steak basically just a big block of turkey uh you know it's just so much easier than like cooking uh chicken and there's just no benefit to cooking the chicken anyway you know i know how to i can cook chicken if i wanted it i uh i don't know i guess maybe i'm just a chicken breast hater but the turkey breast is sweet so i had a big block of that about eight and a half ounces so 50 something grams of protein uh, cubed it up, put it into a bowl with some salsa and some fat-free cheese. And then in terms of carbs, uh, I really just went ham on a bag of uh, pretzel chips. Original flavor. I had like a hundred grams of carbs worth all at once, so as soon as I ate it, I took a huge nap. That's one thing that'll happen is, uh, for me, in a bulk state, I, mean, I can eat a whole box of Krispy Kreme donuts and a bowl of cinnamon toast crunch, whatever. I won't get that sugar crash because I'm almost sort of used to eating that much food and that kind of food during the day. But, you know, when I'm dieting right now, I'll get hit with, uh, like I guess what you call a, uh, what am I trying to think? Carb coma? Like after I eat a bunch of food, I'll get like, oh, I kind of tired for a minute because my blood sugar will spike. And then I'm super, uh, like if I went the whole day eating just really low, glyce low f foods that are low on the glycemic index, which uh, like oatmeals and sweet potato, or oatmeals and yams and like wheat bread, stuff like that, what you'd refer to as more of like a complex carb, those are low on the glycemic index, right? Meaning they're not just gonna spike your blood sugar like that. So if I go, you know, a couple of days just eating <laughs> foods on the low glycemic index, or on the lower end, and then I have like, you know, 150 grams of just any kind of carb all at once, and I have a big insulin spike, then I'll kind of have like a blood sugar crash. I, I don't know how much you guys know about carbs and stuff like that, but yeah, I'm a little more sensitive to getting sleepy from eating a lot of food when I'm cutting down, but I don't really need to do that anyway. You know, the whole point for me dieting is I want to spread my food out throughout the day nice and evenly. So really, I kind of just screwed myself, because now I don't have a ton of calories left to play with before I go to bed. So, I've been aiming for 2,500, but I've been kind of loose with it for this whole month. Like, uh, I needed to go back through the... Actually, what am I talking about? I, need to... I can do it right now. So, one thing with the stupid, simple macro tracker is it'll, it can show you the average over the last 30 days. 
Um, oh, I guess I've been pretty good then. So over the last 30 days, the average macros has been 220 grams of carbs, 80 grams of fat, 226 grams of protein, and average calories 25, 34. Okay, so I guess I'm, I guess I kind of am, am on track. What am I talking about? I, I, I bet I forgot to track some. I, because I've been doing more like 27, 2800 calories. I think I'm gonna try to really lock it in on 2500 for the next month. Uh, and I think the reason I've been kind of lax about it is because, you know, I'm getting leaner, right? The cut is resulting in, you know, noticeable changes. So I'm not like super strict on myself. I'll go over on the carbs and the fats a little bit. But that is not the way to do it. <laughs> you know, if you're not noticing any changes on the scale or any visual changes of your body fat, then you've got to change some shit up and you got to do it in a very strict way. You know, just, I mean, I don't want to just do a calorie counting preaching session every car talk, but I swear the number one factor which is going to determine whether or not the, you gain weight or lose weight and when you add muscle, uh, when you add bodybuilding weight training into that equation, then the only thing that's going to change whether or not you gain muscle or lose fat is if you eat in a calorie surplus or if you eat in a calorie deficit. I know with about a gram per pound of protein per a gram per pound of body weight of protein. It's kind of a long one right there, but as a beginner, you know, hit your gram per pound of protein and just get in the gym. Perfect way to start. So let's uh, let's get into what. We're going to do over the next few, in the very direct foreseeable future. Uh, I'm going to go home, eat something, shower off, I'm fucking gross, do my laundry. I've, I've been good about keeping my, keeping my laundry clean, folded. I've got, I was in a bit of a bad habit of just like, oh, you ever throw your laundry under your bed as a way to motivate yourself to do it? Where it's like, oh, well, I can't go to bed until I do my laundry. And then you just scoot the laundry off to one side. Ugh. It's fucked up. I've been good about that as of late. Home, food, play with my cat. That's it. That is freaking it. I don't have any schoolwork this weekend. Very lucky. Very lucky for me. And then early morning cardio tomorrow. Uh, I forgot to bring a scale. So I have my one. I like to just use the same scale. Uh, when I come back and forth just because you know some scales are just off so you know keeping your weighing you know your weight checking routine consistent is gonna give you some legit actual trackable data so that means not only should you probably use the same scale every morning but you should also do it at the same time you know I brought this up before if you weigh yourself at 3 p.m. That your weight can fluctuate so insanely, like by a pretty solid amount of pounds. You know, I can wake up at 234, and even on a cut, by the time it's like three, I could weigh 240. Let's say I just had a big meal, I just drank a ton of water. You know, your weight can just change a pretty substantial amount just from the amount of food and water that you've had so far. So weighing yourself in the morning after you go to the bathroom is the most consistent method if you're gonna you know, be serious about tracking your stuff and whatever. But cardio in the morning, uh, I might throw abs in after cardio, kind of just for fun. Like, in my opinion, once you've built your abs, or not, I mean, I don't even consider this an opinion, more of an observation. Once you've built your abs and they're, you know, pretty defined, like that you've actually got them developed, you're not going to lose them if you keep lifting. Like, sure, you could get, you know, fatter and they could get covered up, but your abs get used so often, not only in your workouts, but just in your life, moving around. Plus, <laughs> I'd say abs are the muscle that people flex the most when they're checking themselves out in the mirror. Like, all that combined is enough to keep them there. Like, I, you don't, after you've got a solid set of abdominals from ideally, well, I guess not ideally, this is more so my, my opinion. 
I think doing cable crunches or like weighted machine crunches is probably going to be your best bet. Just because why would you train them any differently than like all the other muscles on your body where you use resistance? You know, I wouldn't want to do a body weight quad workout. I want to get on a squat or a leg extension or a hack squat, you know, stuff like that. So why would I want to do a body weight workout for my abs? You know, for me, that's just kind of how everything clicks in my freaking brain. But so if you don't have them, your body fat percentage may play a role. I'm not going to lie. If you're too, uh, if you're holding on to too many lipids, I'm, I'm trying not to say if you're too fat, if you're holding on to too many lipids, then yeah, you're not going to be able to see your abs. But they do have to be developed like any other muscle. You know, when people say they're built in the kitchen, I think it's more so they're revealed in the kitchen. They have to be built in the gym. So back to the crib. I'll see you next time. Did you do your cardio? I guess if I say today, it's probably guaranteed not true. Have you done cardio this year? Have you done cardio in your whole life? Maybe not. Maybe freaking not. So it's uh, it's 11:07 on a Sunday. Perfect time to go to the Planet Fitness and sit on the seated bike for 30 minutes. I uh, I probably would prefer to go to the Y near me just because they have a sauna. And I mean, it's not like I think I'm doing anything crazy in the sauna. Like, I'm not reaping any insane benefits. I just kind of like being in there after cardio. When I'm when I'm cutting down, though, you know, when I'm bulking, I want to just do the cardio and then get back to the house and eat something. But on a cut, usually I'll jump in the sauna sometimes, kind of just for fun. Sweat some... Just sweat. But... Let's, uh, let's just break down the routine of what the morning cardio even is. So, I took all my vitamins. I had, uh, I had some toast dipped in some olive oil with some salt and... I wanted to dip it in salt with, uh, like, spicy pepper flakes. But the only thing I had was black pepper. It was fine, but whatever. So, I had my vitamins with some fats, with some lipids. So that's going to be your, probably your best bet is to take vitamins with food, you know, specifically fats, since some of them are fat soluble. But did that, took my, actually I didn't do 200 milligrams of a caffeine capsule, of the pure calf, hostile caffeine capsule. I, uh, I got two of those uh, Mountain Dew mystery flavors, zero sugar of course. I drank those. That's where I got my 220 grams, oh, 220 milligrams of caffeine from. You know, I'll kind of rip on the energy drinks sometimes, just because you can get like the only thing I want out of it is the caffeine. But it is a treat, so it's not like it's a problem. But if you're doing like four or five a day, you know, for one thing, I think you have a a caffeine tolerance issue, which is its own problem. But, I mean, that's like 15, 20 bucks a day of energy drinks, man. Now, unless you're getting like a pallet wholesale, it's probably not the best method. But, two of those, so... It's not like I need the caffeine to do the cardio. I think I remember looking something up where it was like, you know, having caffeine in your system is going to make you use lipids for energy more easily. But either way, morning, morning cardio coincides with morning caffeine just to kind of wake up. I don't feel like I do that much caffeine. I mean, I only do two in the morning and then two or three, you know, 100 milligrams for the workout. You know, the daily recommended allowance is 400 milligrams. And I'm kind of a bigger guy. So I think, I think I'm probably on point with my caffeine consumption. But, oh yeah, so, you know, in terms of the types of cardio you can do, you know, you got the Stairmaster, the treadmill, I guess you can just walk around, go on a jog, you know, I'm not really into that, uh, just because, for one thing, kind of high impact, you know, I don't really, at least me, I don't want to be running around <laughs> like that, you know, I like the smoothness of the pedaling action, but also, if you're running around for a half hour, you don't get to really play on your phone at all, you can just listen to your music. Now, this isn't really a rip on people who like to jog for their cardio. I just, I'm not into it. 
I'd rather sit down on the seated bike. Or, uh, I guess it's not, the seated bike is the one where the pedals are right beneath you. I'm thinking more so of the, uh, oh, what are they, what's it called? I forget. It's like a seat, but the pedals are like kind of in front of you. I think that's the easiest one, just because for me to do 300 calories worth of cardio, at least what the machine says is 300 calories on like the treadmill, then I've got to do at least like a 4 or 5% incline, go 3-ish, maybe 3.5 three miles an hour, and at a walking pace, well, still walking, like not breaking into a little bit of a jog, you know, that's going to take like 45 minutes. So it takes a little longer. And then if I do the seated bike like I like, you know, I can get the machine up to 300 and I could break a solid sweat pretty quick. Like, it's not like the numbers are that important. Uh, I kind of just use that to maintain consistency. But I mean, sometimes I'll go extra hard and do like 400 calories. But for the most part, you set the difficulty, I set it to around 10, 10 or 11. And then I pedal at such a rate that the machine says I've earned 10 calories a minute. So if that's a little bit too much, like when I'm doing it, if I can tell that I'm actually starting to really fatigue my legs, then I'll lower the difficulty a little bit. So don't just, you know, do whatever settings I say, right? Do a difficulty that you can maintain for 30 minutes, but, you know, is enough that's actually going to get your heart rate up and let you break a sweat. After this, I'll probably just go home, eat some, eat some something. Not really, not really sure what. I haven't. Uh, so since I, I didn't just have bread with that olive oil. All I had was a keto bun. So instead of like, you know, 30 grams of carbs, I've only had three. So the home breakfast macros, you know, hardly even a breakfast. But it was only three grams of carbs. Uh, I think eight grams of fat. That's it. You know, I guess I wouldn't have minded a little bit of protein, but I'm not really concerned with, like, muscle breakdown right now. You know, I, it makes sense, though. You'd want to eat some protein right when you wake up because you just went the whole night without it. But I'm not insanely, or I'm not in such an insane deficit that I'm worried about, like, going catabolic. So I think that's pretty much all i got to say. Let's cut to the... Uh, Planet Fitness locker room pose down after the cardio, and then we we'll drive back and talk about some other random shit. All right, this is a fucking thick hoodie. I did not expect to be that hot. I was almost maybe pushing the limit of sweatiness there, because it was kind of like I was drenched from the cardio, and then just sitting there doing you know poses like sitting there and flexing. You're kind of, you're kind of getting a little sweaty then too. Like I had, <laughs> I had to kind of dab myself off with some paper towels before I put the hoodie on, just so I could, you know, get my arms through it. But cardio is done, and now not only do I need food, but I need something to drink. I'm probably gonna slam. Oh, I don't even. I think the hostile jugs are two, about two liters. I'm sure I'll fill the whole thing up. Do maybe two scoops of the Silo 9. I, uh, oh shit. They're doing a buy one, get one. F I think it's buy one, get one 50% off. Ah, I'm not sure. I need to look again. But here, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll add it to the description. So the Silo 9 is like a little amino electrolyte mix that I like. Honestly, I should have been sipping on that for cardio. You know, it's not like I think that doing cardio is going to, like, make me burn muscle. But I definitely want some amino acids floating around my system. Especially since I didn't eat any protein for breakfast. Yeah, that one. What the hell was I thinking? And then I'd probably feel a little bit more hydrated than I am right now. But what are you going to do? So I'll get home, fill up the jug with that, and probably just slam it before I even eat anything. And then a couple hours later, I'm going to get legs going. So that's going to be... Uh, that's going to be with the hostile guys, so keep an eye out for that leg day. I'm kind of hyped up for it. We're going to this uh, pretty sick gym in Columbus. But uh, apart from that, so I mean, you'll see that in the future. That'll be kind of a, a callback to now. But if you're curious, like, 
Oh, does he only do cardio when he posts the videos about it? No, man. He does cardio every day. At least, you know, for the most part. If there's, if I have a scheduling issue, or I had to stay up like super late, and it would cut into my sleep, then sometimes I may take off. But no, for the most part, if you sleep, if you sleep enough and you get your food in, cardio in the morning and then training in the evening, I find that to be the best method. And I'm not saying that you should jump straight into that, right? But the advanced lifter, you know, someone who's been lifting for a while, you know, he's constantly exposed to that sort of uh, stimulus, right? If you took a total noob, a total beginner who's never lifted before, and you put him through a push-pull legs, like, three-day loop, like have him come in for push and pull and then legs, you know, hit his whole body in those three days, he's probably going to need a couple days to recover. This is a totally new stimulus. But your body gets better and better at dealing with recovering from the workouts as time passes. So, I mean, I've been doing pretty much no rest days since the beginning of the lifts in high school. You know, I couldn't even remember a time where I took more than maybe two days off in a row. Uh, yeah, not even... Like, I've had, a, I've had a couple of surgeries. I had my knee surgery, I think, three years ago. Uh, I didn't have, like, a brutal, um, like, tear or anything weird. Uh, I was coming back from the rec, the, uh, the rec center. It was kind of icy, and I sort of slipped and, like, popped this shit out. So, what? I mean, it, it was kind of, like, weird because I sort of tweaked it, too, when I was walking some dumbbells back to the bench. But basic gist was they didn't, they gave me an MRI, and, like, the inside of my knee... Like, let's say this is the end of my, uh, you know, my thigh bone, my femur, right? This round part with all the cartilage, it's supposed to be nice and smooth so it can rub up against the, uh, my shin like that. And a piece of cartilage and bone had, like, flipped around. The guy said it was like having a rock in my shoe. But so they had to cut into me, grab that thing, and just pull it out. And it wasn't such a big piece that they had to replace it with, like, a cadaver either. So they just sewed me up and put me on my way. And I was doing chest like a couple of days later or I was I don't know I forget how long it took because I didn't uh, I did have to sit and keep it pretty straight for a couple days but that's the only time I could really remember having you know a couple of days off you know even when I cut my hand really good like all sorts of thumb muscle in here sliced open on accident because I was my knife safety was uh not readily available to my mind at the moment, but whatever, you know, they sewed me up, and I, <laughs> so I had to get like a reconstructive surgery to put all my tendons back together, but just at the emergency room, they, they sewed me up from the outside, you know, that same day, I still went in and did legs, all I did was leg extensions and hamstring curls, you know, in terms of just general approach to when you're injured, I find that just staying at home resting is probably your worst option, especially if you, you know, have been in the zone of lifting for a long time. What good is it going to do you to just sit, you know, if you if you totally smash your leg, go in and do shoulders and arms, or if your wrist gets totally wrecked somehow? I can't really, I don't even like to imagine these injuries because it almost feels like I'm asking for it. But you know, if some portion of your body is just fucked. Or let, let's say screwed up, I'm trying to trying to reduce the f bombs a little bit subconsciously. Let's say some part of your body is messed up. It is in your best interest to work around it, because what's going to happen if you just sit at home for like three weeks? Y your metabolism, blah blah blah. Your metabolism's going to crash. Uh, you're just God, you're just going to slow down in general. You know you're meant to move around. This is you're not supposed to just sit. Unless you're like, you know, emergency room level, you got to keep the routine going and work around it. Working around an injury will always be better than just sitting around, sitting around an injury. And that does not mean work through an injury. That is not what I'm trying to say. You know, if I, uh, sometimes I'll tweak my, like I've tweaked my quads before just a little bit. I've pulled my hamstrings pretty good. Uh, I've kind of pulled my chest before. Never like you know, tear-wise, kind of just intramuscular, like, a, well, a pull. Um, 
and I'm <laughs> there's no chance I would try to like keep doing the workout through that. You know, that is sort of your first response, like oh fuck, I'll just I'll finish the workout, whatever. Like, no, that is not the way to go about it. If you if you can tell you tweak something legit, that's when you hit the brakes instantly. You know, if I do a chest workout and like first set of bench, I feel a little something. Done. No more. If I if I do think it's well, I guess it has to be bad enough that I think it's worth stopping for. You know, but you should be able to gauge that pretty well. At least, you definitely should as time passes. But, you know, if my chest is wrecked and I need to take like a month off of heavy pressing, so what? You know, no heavy pressing for me. I'm still going to hit back and arms and shoulders and chest and legs and calves and forearms. And then, you know, once it kind of does start to recover, I want to jump into moving it around. You know, I'm not just going to get straight to a three-plate bench, but, you know, I'd get on the pec deck really light, get some activations, maybe just do some cable presses, you know, stuff that doesn't, uh, what's the word, let's say aggravate the, uh, the area. That's going to be all right for you, and probably good for you, you know, just getting a pump and some nutrients. Hell yeah, man. So, I think uh, that's probably enough of the injury talk. Ideally, you never even have to think about that, because you'll never get injured. But you know, it's, if you're seriously pushing yourself hard, it's kind of just part of the game. So you got to be able to adapt and overcome to that sort of shit. Uh, but I get back home, drink my drinks, eat my... Mm, oh, yeah, fuck yeah, I got a bunch of top-round steaks. Lean cut, I think, I'll, I think I'll make one of those. That'll be perfect. Maybe I'll do maybe I'll do half of one of those with some egg whites, and I'll toast some of the keto buns and turn it into a whole breakfast. All right, I'm so, now I'm starting to get excited. So I'll probably have that and a couple more meals, and then I've got legs tonight. So this is a little bit of a quick one, but you know what are you gonna do? I'll see you next time. All right, old habits. Old habits appear to die hard. It is 10.09. 10 oh freaking nine at night. It's I've been on a pretty good streak of lifting, you know, before like six. But man, I don't know what happened. I go to lay down at like probably five or so. And <laughs> I just woke up at 9.30. Yeesh. So luckily, I've got one membership in the works which is for a 24-hour gym so I'm not boned you know that'll that has happened before uh, not just me sleeping in or well is that e that doesn't even count as sleeping in that's just fucking being irresponsible but you know if your gym closes at six or so kind of screw it a little bit man you gotta lift early 24-hour gyms are the way to go the school rec center, they open, they're open till 11, which is pretty good, but I, I didn't have time to get a full chest and shoulder workout in there before 11, so driving over to the 24-hour gym. Luckily, it should be empty, so I won't have to worry about waiting for any kind of equipment or working in with anybody, but then again, you know, on the opposite end of the pros and cons. There's gonna be some low energy in there, right? Nobody's gonna be lifting. And not that that's really gonna bother me though. Honestly, I don't even I think I like when I'm in a gym that's got some people moving around doing stuff. But you know, unless the G well, how do I even want to phrase this? Unless part of that little population is really going hard, uh, to an extent I'm just it, it just kind of feels like the gym is busy. Right. If every squat rack is taken, but every squat rack has a freak on it, then I'm going to be thinking more so, oh shit, alright, it's fucking cool in here. Rather than, what the fuck are all these people doing on this equipment? I need to get I need to get a rack, I need a bench. So, more often than not, you know, the general public you're going to see at the gym is obviously not... Not everybody's trying to be a freak, but whatever. What freaking ever. So yeah, no, like I was trying to say, um, it might just be a little bit low energy. Now that's not to say that I think I'm going to have a bad lift. No freaking chance. You know, I wouldn't mind if the gym was empty every time I went. Because right? I got 
a little bit of a checklist that I want to check off. Lift some heavy weight, get a pump, check the pump. Fuck, man, I guess that's it. Just three, three little goals each left. And whether or not there's people around, it shouldn't really change that for you, you know? Should not really change that for you. So, plan for chest is going to be a variety of pressing movements. I could foresee some Smith machine. Uh, yeah, I can kind of just foresee some Smith machine. I don't know. I'll see, because, you know, I've got three big ones at my disposal. I've got incline dumbbell, incline barbell, and incline smith machine. No. Yeah. Though, there are some differences, obviously, with the, um, the incline dumbbell. I would say it's a lot more... Like, the workload of the set is much more constant because you can be at the top with the dumbbells in, like, what you'd call the resting position, but you're still flexing your pecs super hard because the dumbbells want to fucking, you know, fall off to your sides. So it's kind of more of a constant burn with the inclined dumbbell. Then inclined barbell, you don't have that, uh, you don't have to activate your chest so much at the top. So at the lockout, you can kind of take a moment, sort of uh, recover just a touch, take a couple of breaths, and then go for another rep. But it's still a free weight. And then with Incline Smith, you know, same deal. You don't have to activate so many stabilizers, so you can kind of be a little bit more brutish with your last couple of reps. And you don't have to worry about a spotter, because you can just re-rack it. So but they're all pretty much doing the same shit in my upper chest. I'd say in the whole chest, but I try to bias the upper chest. That's why I do the incline. So, you know, they're all doing the same stuff, basically. But there's a few key differences as well. So, let's say I just want to do incline dumbbell. And there's no real reason beyond the fact that I'm just thinking to myself, okay, incline dumbbell is probably going to feel pretty good. I'm sure, like, subconsciously I'm going through a bunch of, like... Uh, factors and like, oh, okay, my shoulder feels like this. Everything feels like, okay, I bet this would be good. I'm not really thinking about it like that. It's more so I walk in, I'm like, eh, fucking Clint Barbell, let's do Smith Machine. Eh, let's just do Hammer Strength Press, whatever. You know? Just over time, you'll kind of get a little bit of a sense for what you know is going to feel good and what you know isn't. And I think that that's a pretty solid way to go about your training. But whatever. So chess is going to be probably... Five or six sets of heavy pressing, two-ish sets of, uh, you know, more of a squeezing, stretch, uh, isolation kind of movement, maybe some flies or pec deck. Uh, but the workout doesn't have to look like that. You know, maybe I could do two sets of heavy pressing and then do some flies and then go back to pressing and then go back to flies. Or who knows, maybe Incline Smith Machine will feel so good I'd want to do eight sets of it. If it felt good. I'd have no problem with that, you know, but we'll have to see. But typically, I'd say your chest workout should be composed of the first half, maybe a little, a little more than the first half of heavy pressing. And then the end, you're trying to get a big stretch with some pec deck, maybe some cable flies, shit like that. Really just finish off the pump and you should be good. Now, I'm not saying that's the best way to do it, but that's how I like it. And then shoulders is just going to be a bunch of lateral raises, and... Oh, yeah. I forgot that I split up side and rear delts. Yeah, shoulders is just going to be eight sets of lateral raises. That's perfect. And then calves at the end. So, no point... No point just hypothesizing what we're going to do. Why don't we just get in there and find out? And with that, another chest and shoulder day is freaking complete. Well, I guess, well, not even. It wasn't even a shoulder day. All I did was side delts. Only one third of the shoulder. Huh. What am I freaking talking about? It's only a third of the shoulder day. But, I mean, I don't really need to work rear delts. No, no, no. I don't need to work front delts. They're pretty big. Uh, they're big enough relatively to everything else. 
So, side delts on their own. Solid. Solid freaking pump. So, plan now is just uh, go home and finish this little packet of steak. Or a little, little meal prep thing of steak. Maybe chill for a minute. Uh. Ooh, finish that. Uh, yeah, so typically what I do is I, I'll cook up about, you know, because I'm not a huge prepper, but I will kind of prep some stuff. So I cooked up, a, when I make a ground beef, right, it comes in a pack of a pound. So typically I'll just do the pound. It makes it a little bit, uh, a little bit easier just going by the pound instead of like doing half a pound and then doing another half a pound later. Uh, so I don't eat the whole thing at once. You know, a pound of ground beef, it's about 80, 90-ish grams of protein. Not that I think I won't absorb it and use most of it if I eat it all at once, but you know, I want to spread it out, you know. I want to stay full for longer periods. So if over the course of four hours I could eat 80 grams of protein at once or 50 grams of protein twice, 40 grams of protein twice, that just makes more sense. Uh, but typically I'll make that little mix of either just keep it plain in a cup or plain in a bowl, eat maybe half of it, just saran wrap it for later. Uh, what? I don't even know where I was going with that. Yeah, that's how I do it. Yeah, I don't, I don't do half a pound at once. I'll just do a full pound and kind of scratch at it for a little while. Uh, but tomorrow I'll do a whole little, a whole full day of eating. <sighs> so I've got a busy day tomorrow. I gotta go to. I've got a, a couple of actual classes, so I've got 8:30 as my tech. One of my technical electives that I have. It's like a sculpture class. It's kind of fun. Definitely just a little bit of a. Just something to change it up from my normal math and physics and thermo stuff. Plus. That class is one of my favorites this year, or this semester, because it's got two dudes from the gym that I know in it. So, you know, it's a bunch of kind of art major dudes, and then just us three lifters in the corner having a good time, which is perfect. Which is freaking perfect with me. So, I'll, I'll probably prep a little bit of food. You know, it'll, pro it'll uh, that'll be kind of funny. Just pop a squat in the in one of the fucking engineering buildings and just chow down on whatever I end up eating. But, you know, I could... Mm. Oh. Mm. I could still eat similar kinds of foods to the last cut. Or no, no, no. The last bulk. I just have to eat less of them. You know, Like I always say, if I could, uh... If I hit my macros of 250 grams of protein, uh, obviously coming from a dedicated protein source, like meats, fish, dairy products, stuff like that. Like, I don't really count incomplete protein, like from breads or grains and stuff like that. Legumes, if you want to get mad technical. Um, but if I hit get that 250 grams in a protein, of solid protein, obviously. You know, if I hit my 50 grams of fat and my 250 grams of carbs from, you know, my cereal or random treats... I'm still going to be in a deficit, but I wouldn't want to do that because those foods aren't very filling. You know, those are calories which I could eat 500 calories worth of. <sighs> if I had a 500 calorie bowl of cinnamon toast crunch and whole milk, that probably wouldn't fill me up as much as if I had a 500 calorie plate of keto bread hamburger buns with you know some lean ground beef with fat free cheese and zero sugar barbecue sauce mixed in kind of as like a little sloppy joe style um, you know, plate 500 calories of that, of that is going to be a lot more filling because for one thing the keto bread it just has more like it's, it's just more voluminous you know it's not very dense or no yeah it's not very dense so it's a lot more filling now, in a bulking context, <laughs> you're not going to catch me eating keto bread. You're not going to catch me drinking a zero cat like a Sprite Zero. No, man, I need some calories. Right? I need some fuel for the furnace. Now, right now, I'm trying to 
not throw so much fuel fuel in there. So this uh, this morning was two thirty five point four pounds, but yesterday I had like four thousand calories, like a fool, uh, unintentional refeed just because I was kind of hungry, and I was, I was driving back home to school. <laughs> I was fucking getting it was. I drove home at an irresponsible hour, let's just say that. So, I stopped at Sheets. I got some Sheets chicken sandwiches to tide me over, which threw me over my calorie limit like a, like a chump. So, I think another couple of days at 2,500. We should probably be floating around maybe 233, maybe 232 pounds-ish, something like that. You know, We're not dropping weight off by the slice, like two pounds, three pounds a week. Uh, so that's not the point. I'm not doing a deficit that, that that's that steep. Like, I'm definitely trying to be in a deficit. I'm getting leaner as time progresses. But, you know, your day-to-day -day weight can fluctuate like crazy. You know, if I were to not, like, if I were to kind of just stop drinking water at like three o'clock today, and maybe you know, only drink a little bit, whatever, go to bed early and then sleep in until like maybe noon the next day I could get on the scale and be like three or four pounds lighter just because I'm a bit more dehydrated like I've got just less water in my system because uh, you gotta think at around 230 you know a two pound difference it's, it's less than one percent so you know, your body's mainly water so your day to day weight is gonna fluctuate just a touch what you're really kind of looking for is a weekly trend. But, you know, I'm not really hitting like a massive steep decline of calories, or of, uh, of weight. It was kind of more of an initial drop, like a very steep drop right when the bulk was over. And then now kind of a steady, slow downward slope. But that's what I'm going for. I'm not trying to lose strength, I'm trying to hold on to as much muscle as I can. And, you know, just trim a little bit of fat off before the next bulk. You know, I'm not going to stage ready. Not even close. But I do have maybe three and a half-ish more weeks. I think we'll probably get to maybe day 60 or so. And then I'll cut it, you know. I'm much more inclined to cut the cut short than I would be to extend it like the bulk, you know. So, yeah, another couple of weeks, we'll just get a little freakier. Get a little bit of a... Uh, what's the word? Get a little bit of a hint, or not a hint, a little bit of a better idea of just how I'm looking. You know, because sometimes you don't really notice imbalances and stuff like that until you get a little bit leaner and you can really see what you're working with. You know, so one thing that uh, kind of jumps out at me, not brutally, but triceps, that is one thing that I will be focusing on directly. Well, okay, obviously I'm focusing on everything directly. But I am going to give triceps a little bit of special treatment for this next bulk. Maybe I'm going to... Well, for one thing, I'm going to change up the training style. Probably out of everything, triceps will get changed up the most significant. Blah, blah, blah. The most significantly. Especially in terms of exercise selection. Because I seriously need to bias overhead stuff. Really work the long head. You know, because when you're doing like a double by flex like this, you want your tricep to fucking hang off your arm. So, buys are looking good, tries are lacking just a touch. But other than that, man, I just want some more meat all around. Big legs, big chest. Back and shoulders are doing pretty good. I will say that back and shoulders are pretty freaky for me. I've always had kind of a big back. I, I kind of win a couple of months not even really hitting back on a consistent basis. I think on one of the last bulks, maybe, maybe a bulk or two ago, because it was kind of a little bit ahead of the game. I wanted to get chest a tad bit bigger. But, you know, if you've got a lagging body part, which is most likely, uh, which is more likely, maybe give it some special treatment. Maybe hit it a little bit more frequently. Maybe try to change up your training style with that specific body part with a little bit more you know, emphasis, because you got to figure out how it works. If your chest is growing, guess what? Your chest training is probably good. If your back is lacking a tad, then you've got to focus a little bit more on your back. Maybe find out how people are doing it, what you're doing wrong, potentially. Or shit like that. Now, if you got a muscle that's ahead of the game, 
Like for me, my shoulders are pretty much all right, I would say, relatively to everything else. You know, when I'm actually bulking up, I don't even really hit them on a consistent basis. Maybe once every, honestly, probably once every week, max. Uh, honestly, I mean, at this last bulk, I hit them what, maybe once every two and a half weeks. Uh, just because they're there, you know? So I want my arms to catch up, so I'll chill out on them. But more, more likely than not, you don't have a body part that's ahead of the game. You got a couple that are lagging behind. So, not to say that that is a serious problem, right? But it is something that you should take into consideration when you're kind of trying to design your own little training style or whatever. Or I guess if you want to get a coach, then I guess they'll deal with that for you when they come up with your program uh, and stuff like that. I'm not really a massive coach fan, but you do what you want to do. Home, food, TikTok, I presume. Uh, nothing else, man. I cleaned my kitchen today. Did all my laundry. Room is nice and clean. All my homework's done. I'm on my A game right now. That's how it's. Uh, that's how it should be. That's how it freaking should be. Uh, hopefully, I don't. Um, Hopefully I didn't, like, miss a Canvas notification or something. I, uh, I'm not a massive Google Calendar fan, so sometimes shit will sneak up on me. But I'm sure a solid portion, honestly, probably the majority of you guys are in school of some sort, either college or high school. Make sure to balance that shit out. Like, I'm not saying s skip out on your studies, of course, but... I'm, uh, for me, it's always been a bit easier to kind of cut back on, uh, let's just say, social extracurriculars to get technical. You know, I've, uh, me and my brother, we've kind of got this friend group from high school. You know, they'll, we'll all kind of come over, hang out, whatever. And, like, they'll go out to this one bar in town, and I'm like, shit, man, I gotta stay home eat. Or, you know, some shit like that. And, I mean, for me, that's kind of normal. I, I just, in general, I'm a little bit... Like, I don't have a problem being kind of reclusive like that. Like, not that I'm not social, but, you know, I got my own shit to do sometimes. But I could definitely foresee a pretty solid majority of you guys struggling with, um, you know, with wanting to cut back on that sort of thing. You know, FOMO is a pretty powerful phenomenon. But then again, you got to think to yourself, what are you going to, what are you going to enjoy more later on? You know, that one night of doing just random BS or, you know, knowing that you were on track. And that's not, a, that's not a rhetorical question either, you know? I'm not saying you should totally cut that shit out, right? But ideally, you have a pretty solid balance. You know, maybe plan ahead if you're ever going to... Yeah, in the summertime, not as much now. Everybody's kind of dispersed and gone their own ways to different school, whatever. But, you know, we'll, uh... Like, whenever we got, like, a day trip planned or some shit like that, like Cedar Point or, like whatever, you know, just plan accordingly. You can balance this shit out. Unless you're, like, insanely strapped for time with you know, work, this, that, and the other, whatever, your responsibilities. I think you can come up with an hour and a half in your day. Uh, well, I think you could come up with an hour and a half in the day, whether or not you, know, you actually want to put that effort in. You know, that's on your end. So, let's, um, There appears to be an accident of some sort. Let's, let's drive nice and slow, try not to stir the waters. I feel like I'm on live PD right now. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what was going on. But unrelated to that guy, Home, food, shower off, I'm fucking, oh, I'm so sweaty. I tell you what though, I don't really reek that bad. At least, I wonder why too, because like I'll be drenched in sweat. And I mean, unless I'm nose blind, well, I guess I just don't smell that bad. But if you know that you fucking stink, dude, come on, that is the fucking worst feeling. Wear your freaking deodorant. Get your, um... Oh, God, what's it called? 
get your Dr. Squatch. I love that stuff. So, and now, now I'm just really saying random BS. Home, food, sleep, cardio in the morning, and then tomorrow is back in rear delts. I foresee back being a solid, solid ASS pump. So, ideally, you'll do the same thing. Maybe not back, but just get a solid pump. Hit your macros, be it bulking, cutting, essentially just main gaining. You know, hit your protein, get your protein shakes in, whatever. Take your multivitamin, multivitamin and fish oil, ideally. Your creatine, your pre-workout. Just keep grinding, man. Day in, day out. You know the deal. So, we'll see you next time. Let's get ready to go hit back and rear delts. So, basic plan for back. Honestly, just a bunch of rows, pull downs, and pullovers. I mean, what else really is there, if we're being honest? I definitely don't want to do anything like without my chest supported. I wouldn't want to be doing bent over barbell rows right now because I'm still feeling my glutes from the last leg day. And that was. Ugh, that was two days ago. So, back first, and then we'll finish with rear delts. I don't know. I, I don't really think I would get much out of doing rear delts first. For the most part, I think I want to train my, let's just say the muscle that I'm biasing, or the muscle I want to grow more first. Like if I were to do chest and tries, I want to do chest first and then tries. It gets a little bit weird because with legs, I do it backwards. I'll do hamstrings first and then quads. But that kind of serves a different purpose because when I do hamstrings first, they get a lot of blood flow in my knees. I just kind of feel better when I move on to, you know, leg extensions and presses and whatnot. But really nothing too tricky with back. I mean, I don't mess with any, like, low back focus days or, like, upper back focus days. I just kind of hit the whole thing. I mean, sometimes I'll have, like, a back day where it's mainly pull-downs, like, mainly lat focused, and then other days I'll have one where it's a little bit more row biased. I think just an even spread of both is probably fine, you know, you don't have to do a dedicated day for each. Because at the end of your, let's say you do a normal, you hit everything twice a week style split. If you do an upper back focus day and then a lower back focus day, you'll end up doing the same amount of work as the guy who did a just kind of whole back focus day twice. So probably nothing to really read into there. And the, only, the only other thing in terms of my back training that's a little bit controversial is, you know, I never deadlift. The most I ever, the most I've ever deadlifted for a complete rep was a 405 in high school. Uh, I did a. It's what happened was the next week. This was so early in my training that a, a back day was just like maxing out my deadlifts. How far we've come. Hmm. Huh. But. I hit 405 and then the next week I went for 455. And I got it to my shins, but I couldn't finish the rep. And then I just never deadlifted again. So I didn't get hurt or anything. I was just like, yeah, this is stupid, whatever. And honestly, I still kind of have the same mentality about it. You know, I can kind of justify a little bit better now, like I'm about to. It's when you're doing deadlifts, you're working your glutes, your lower back a ton, your erectors. Your hamstrings are coming into play like crazy. Now, sure, you'll get some lack, some lack. You'll get some lat and some upper back, some trap development. I'm not gonna say you won't. People with big backs have been built, or people have built big backs by deadlifting. It's, undone, it's undeniable. But in a bodybuilding context, you know, I want to just hit my lats with you know as much energy as I can muster. So I'd rather not waste a ton of energy and get super gassed after. Let's say even just two sets of heavy deadlifts. Cause sure, I'll stimulate my lats, but I will, uh, oh my God. I'll also waste a ton of energy hitting my glutes and my hamstrings, which I don't want to do. You know, I'm not doing posterior chain day. I'm going to the gym to do a back day. So I only want to hit back. That's why I'm using straps too. So I don't have my forearms and biceps come into play at least not too much when I'm doing my pull downs or rows, because again, I want to just focus on my back. 
lats, traps, rhomboids, all sorts of shit in between. So the only other thing I could kind of say is a tip is if you're not using lifting straps, I would highly advise it. You know, everybody, I know that you're probably thinking to yourself, oh, uh, well, you know, I want to build my forearms. If you want to build your forearms, you should hit your forearms directly. Don't compromise your back training and your forearm training just because you want to multitask. That's uh, that's just my feeling on the matter, at least. So, I'm fucking still yawning. I go slam the pre. Two scoops of bloodshot and a scoop of hostility. Fuck. I forgot to take my beta alanine. I've been adding beta alanine in to the pre. Uh, and it doesn't have... I'm pretty sure it doesn't have... Uh, like immediate effects, it's you kind of build up. It's like it's like creatine. You kind of build up a level of satiation of it, and then it kind of takes effect. So I'm in the loading phase of the beta alanine this month, but I can just take it when I get back, and it'll still do its thing. So enough chit chat. Let's uh, let's just get started. <laughs> 